we are now live and this is a joint meeting of House Ways and Means and House Appropriations. And uh, we've asked Tom Cavett to uh, give um, a very, very brief uh, uh, sort of overview of the revenue forecast. I know a lot of members have listened to it already. And so most of what we're gonna do today is give members from both committees a chance to ask questions um, once we get started. Uh, Katie, did you have anything you wanted to say by well, way of introduction? Just to remind anyone who is listening in that at two o'clock the e-board did meet and we did take a vote and, and the consensus forecast has been approved. And, yeah. and so um, it's, it's what it is, it, it was approved unanimously. And so um, with that, I think Tom should just um, uh, step in and, um, and do a quick review. I, many of you may have joined in. Have you, did you have yeah. the e-board? Yeah, I think most people have heard the presentation at least once. At least um, once. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so Tom, go ahead. Good. Um, yeah, I think the the prior presentations and just the first page of what um, you know is in the handout uh, kind of gives the the whole picture. This is a very unusual forecast. It's a very unusual time, as you all know, and this is not a economic forecast that's being driven by economics. It's being driven by the virus and uh, responses to it. And we've spent as much time looking at epidemiological models as we have economic models. And uh, that's over a, a sustained three or four month period. Uh, early on when, when Mike Pichak, uh, uh, Commissioner Pichak uh, started doing uh, collecting epidemiological information to help with the planning uh, regarding reopening. We were involved in that and we've met regularly to share information. The, the coordination with the administration and, and uh, uh, legislative personnel has been uh, excellent in my uh, uh, estimation. Uh, the tax department's been extraordinary in doing runs uh, very detailed runs to try to figure out what's happening. They're working from home in most cases and still being incredibly productive and, and responsive despite all the pressures they have. Uh, Commissioner Pichek's uh, uh, work um, also has been very time consuming and detailed. And it's kind of the, the, the core both in terms of of the state's ability to be in the, the position it is today, which is which is really kind of best in the nation in terms of, of uh, uh, COVID stats and, and health metrics and that kind of thing. Um, it's, it's a tenuous position always because we're, we're very interconnected with the region and it's hard to sustain that if, if you're not a place like New Zealand where you test everybody that comes in and uh, uh, can sort of manage those flows in a way that, that we really can't. So it's, it's not like uh, just because we're in a good place now, you know, that's, that's necessarily gonna stay, but it's a big advantage. And um, really to, to everyone's credit who's been involved in, in that process. Uh, you know, that said, these, these two areas that, you know, normally we're, we're you know, not spending that much time looking at, which is uh, uh, the path of a pandemic, the viral characteristics and, and, and path that, that the virus might take, uh, and then the federal response, fiscal and monetary response to that, uh, it is a unique situation to be in because neither one of those is uh, particularly predictable. You would think that maybe the, the federal offset could be a little more predictable and the monetary policy has been, but the fiscal policy has been erratic and uh, even a core assumption that we have as part of the numbers that we generated uh, and presented today was that there would be another tranche of fiscal support in the neighborhood of a trillion and a half. So, um, you know, kind of not less than about that amount and that's really in question. It's, it's, it's not clear that that will come through. And the executive order uh, for its substitute doesn't come close to uh, beneficial economic impacts that could 
uh, uh, really be really be meaningful and involves additional uh, state expenditure uh, uh, to accomplish even part of it. So, uh, given those unknowns, I I I think it's very very unlikely that this forecast will have a normal shelf life. That you know, in in January we'd revisit it. I think it's going to be a, a process much like we've had since March, where we generate estimates based on the best information we have, and then we revise them as more information comes in. So early on, we we thought the lockdown might extend through June. So we were estimating impacts as if things were pretty much closed through June. Uh, that turned out not to have to be the case. And, and that's one of the reasons we had much better revenue performance uh, uh, you know, than, than we had thought back then. So we've kind of adjusted to uh, new information um, with a, a May update, a June update, uh, much more cursory than this exercise, um, but, then, but then this. And I think we'll need to do that into the future. And I think your planning, unfortunately, is standing on the same quicksand that we are. So, uh, you know, you may need to change course uh, uh, in a moment's notice, given new information and and new realities, and um, uh, that's just where we're where we're at. So, uh, you know, the numbers that are you know that are out there are all in this uh, summarized in this chart on page fifteen, which is the you know the that typical chart that we have about relative to the last official eboard forecast where the revenues stand. And across all of the funds, you know, it's about $275 million less than was expected uh, in, in uh, uh, January. And that's spread, uh, you know, not very evenly across the funds. It's, it's all detailed, uh, you know, in, in the tables and all that. But uh, there's a very significant revenue risk. And, um, uh, you know, absent, uh, a significant federal offset, th there could be real budgetary uh, stress. And unfortunately, the actions that would need to be taken at the state level, whether it's reducing spending or increasing taxes, would both have very deleterious impacts on the economy. There's a Wall Street Journal article out today uh, that um, references some Moody, uh, Moody's estimates on, on how, how significant that might be. And they project that it would be about, cost about 4 million jobs not to have uh, a state and local government unrestricted fund offset in the neighborhood of, of uh, 500 billion. Uh, it, it represents about 4 million jobs and about three percentage points off our real gross domestic product uh, over the next two years. So, um, you know, it's anybody's guess exactly how that's going to play out. That's still happening. And, you know, we'll, we'll have to be responsive to all of that. Um, so I do want to just make this mostly Q and A because you have heard, uh, most of what, uh, uh, is in the presentation before. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll look for hands. Okay. Anybody have a question? I'm, I'm going to start with one. Um, if, you, if you don't have enough money and you shouldn't raise taxes and you shouldn't cut spending, what are you supposed to do? Uh, absent federal assistance, you don't have a choice uh, unless you want to borrow money. So mm -hmm. you could increase debt, but for a short-term event like this, that, that would be dicey just to fill a budget hole that would be risky too, unless you thought you were gonna pick that up somewhere else. Uh, so, you know, there's not a lot of choice at the state level, I think. Um, and, you know, it, it, it would just be a real bind. Mm -hmm. What about using reserves? Well, yeah, sure. Certainly uh, uh, rainy day funds and all the states were in pretty good shape financially with, with rainy day funds going into this, some better than others. And, uh, same with unemployment insurance funds and things like that. I mean, we were we were in good shape, but but 
you know, we had a rate, we have a good rainy day fund and this is a hurricane. So, you know, get your umbrella out, but it's, it's going to go way beyond that, you know, get a boat. We have, <clears throat> Representative Anthony has his hand raised. Thank you. I just wanted to ask uh, Jeff or Tom what the lag would be. Um, should we enhance revenues knowing uh, that that will have a depressant effect on the economy? Uh, what's the, what's the, uh, the timeline um, if revenues are increased, uh, whether it's income or consumption, uh, you can specify. Uh, I'm just thinking about um, your worry of covering borrowing because, frankly, uh, uh, neither of the other two opportunity or alternatives are attractive. And this wouldn't be the first time the state would take a short-term emergency and turn it into a long-term commitment uh, to keep uh, Vermonters afloat. But I'm interested in the lag time of the depressant effect of an adjustment in revenues. You mean if, if there was borrowing that offset uh, decline in revenues? No, if you purposely raise revenues so that it would enable you to borrow further out um, in order to maintain some degree of uh, provision of social service uh, that wouldn't be present if you, just, if you just did business as usual on an accrual basis and, and covered each fiscal year as we yeah, traditionally have done. Right. So if you raise taxes then to pay either debt load or offset uh, uh, what otherwise would be cuts. Is that, yep. is that the question? Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, obviously it depends where you uh, would raise taxes and uh, typically in the past when there've been situations like this, where there needed to be uh, taxes raised, they were clearly, it was clearly done on a temporary basis. And that can help offset some of the negative impacts from a tax increase. If people don't perceive it to be permanent, then you don't get the same you know, decision-making process that can be uh, more negative around that. Uh, so again, you just have to look to where there's capacity and, and there's obviously a limit to that too. But I, I think that, um, you know, there, there, there have been income tax surcharges and various things like that uh, going all the way back to the Snelling administration uh, that have been employed at times of, of severe revenue stress. And that would be, that, that would probably be the, the least negative way to, uh, you know, if you want to take that course. Thank you. Uh, George. Yes, thanks, Tom. Sort of in this, the same vein, from an economist's point of view, they both have negative effects, the raising taxes of any kind and reducing spending. But is there one that can one be said to be worse than the other or have it or is there a different lag time between the two? Yeah, if, if you cut spending, you have very immediate impacts. Uh, and uh, you know, a, a lot of those jobs have pretty high local multipliers. Uh, so of the two, that would have more immediate negative impacts. Uh, you know, again, if it, it depends on, on what the tax is, if it's a, a, a broad-based tax that, you know, that, that can have fairly quick uh, uh, income offsets as well. Um, but, you know, the kind of thing like a surcharge on, on uh, uh, very high earners or, you know, a segment like that, that you're not apt to get a big uh, uh, change in terms of, of local consumption. That would be the, just from an uh, uh, impact on the economy, that would be the, the least negative, but um, yeah. Of, of those two. Okay, and you know, um, listening to your earlier presentations today, it, it seems as though we've had a bit of a bounce back economically in Vermont. Um, you know, it's, it's still grim, but it's not nearly as grim as we thought it was gonna be. Um, is that, 
um, peculiar to Vermont or are other states with relatively low levels of COVID experiencing the same thing? I'm, I'm not sure I'd really call it a bounce back exactly. Um, you know, we had some good fortune with the deferred personal income revenues that were deferred from April to July. That's all backward looking. That's, that's based on 2019 tax year and it was just a delay in the collection. So that's not, that's not really a bounce. Um, there's been some improvement in, um, you know, in, in labor markets and some reduction in, in unemployment. We were starting from a worse position early on. We did a more complete shutdown. So, you know, just on a percent change basis, you know, that's looking better. And the health metrics support uh, 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 more reopening than a lot of places, uh, uh, you know, could support. But it's uh, almost all the bounce that we're seeing is coming from this phenomenal infusion of federal transfer payments. I mean, really, when you start to add up the programs and, and you know, the, when you go back to 2009, 2010, and we had Tropical Storm Irene, and we got a, a big hit of disaster relief money. That really showed up in a big way on gross state product and a lot of things where we, you know, you had a measurable uptick in economic activity by virtue of this, you know, disaster spending. Uh, it's, you know, what we've gotten in this just dwarfs anything we've ever experienced before. So there's, uh, there's been tremendous stimulus, things like, you know, a bounce back in motor vehicle purchase and use uh, revenues are, are more a function of the federal transfer payments and, and not to necessarily those most in need. That just shows that a lot of that money is going to people that, um, uh, you know, for whom they can either save it, spend it on, you know, uh, things that aren't necessarily uh, basic needs kinds of things. And, and there's a tremendous amount of money that's, that's slashing around. That's, you know, that's unlikely to provide a very long-term bounce, but it's, um, it's, it's giving us most of the juice that we have now. Um, what we need is enough um, momentum to deal with some of the sectors that aren't going to recover quickly, that have longer-term uh, 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 impacts and, and, you know, transition some of those workers and some of those businesses into things that will be sustainable. That's not a quick thing at all. So, you know, that's why there are a lot of lingering effects that, that are going to occur. And certainly at the very bottom, there needs to be uh, a lot of support. So, uh, so they're not massive defaults on, on, mortgages and rent payments and various things like that, which otherwise uh, would occur when people are out of work. Uh, Mary? Thank you. Tom, I'm wondering if you can tell us the sectors that you are in concerned about, assuming that we're going to stay on this trend of partial shutdown or maybe go into a tighter shutdown with the second wave coming and what opportunities, what we ought to be thinking about doing in terms of supporting whatever sector it is that's gonna be hurting the most. Yeah, I mean, leisure and hospitality is, you know, probably, you know, the sort of the bullseye of, of where this is, this is hitting. Uh, there's certainly other sectors too, retail, um, you know, when you look at our sales and use numbers, it masks the fact that uh, there's just been this phenomenal increase in internet related sales. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's through the roof and it's certainly a good thing that that's a part of the tax base now because mm -hmm. without it, we would see uh, big declines. If you even took out the addition of Wayfair that we had, we would have had uh, a decline in sales and use revenue uh, rather than a year-over-year -year increase, even though it's lower than, than was projected in January. Um, but we've seen both sales at existing internet uh, uh, vendors go up, 
and we've seen the number of vendors go up. So a lot of uh, stores and, and, and such that are saying, all right, if I'm gonna survive, I've gotta sell online. Even if a lot of my market's local, I still have to sell online. So we're seeing more and more of, of uh, that happen. But leisure and hospitality is gonna be the, you know, the, the sector that until there's, uh, and, and it doesn't really matter whether it's a, a government directed uh, shutdown, it's, there, there are two real responses to this. And you see this worldwide is, you know, one might be the guidance that, the, that a government provides. The other is what people do based on their own good sense and information that they have. And uh, so I don't think you're gonna get a lot of the tourism back, particularly because a big part of that is an older age cohort that is most vulnerable to the health risks. And that's not gonna come back until people feel safe. And probably that means post some vaccine. And um, uh, so, so that could be much more long-term. I don't know that there's enough money to keep all those businesses afloat. And so, you know, whether they transition and pivot to something else, um, same with the workers, there does need to be, um, you know, a level of support, uh, certainly a, a safety net uh, uh, for the people involved but I don't know that there's enough money to just keep uh, you know, all those businesses around when, there's, when they're not generating any, any activity. So uh, there could be permanent, much more permanent long lasting uh, disruption there. And it's probably beyond the scope of, of either federal or state action, you know, try to offset that. Thank you. I have a question, um, Tom, and I'm not sure really how to articulate it. I, I know what I'm thinking, and it has to do with the several years we've had of um, the one-time money events at the end of the year, and we haven't been able to count on them as ongoing funds. Um, they're they're one-time event, one-time event, and, and it appeared, um, not appeared, we know now that fiscal year 20 would have ended, would have been a stellar year. And would those have continued to have been one-time event or were we actually seeing the economy growing where, where we could move more of those events into the ongoing status? And, and so, and then where are we now? Are we chipped into all the one-time events or into the ongoing events? And I'm, I'm just trying to, it, it, in order to put a, a budget forward in a, in a next week and in the, in the next upcoming weeks, I, I've got to figure out what's one time and what's ongoing going forward and what's been harmed. Yeah, um, there's there's a little of each in terms of, of how those get baked into uh, any analysis. Um, and we review this uh, with the tax department, you know, looking at individual events and and the way they um, they they spread through a lot of different tax sources and, and uh, a lot of different places. So uh, quite often they're connected to uh, some uh, business sale uh, in which there's a high level of Vermont ownership. And, uh, and it's extremely difficult when the event happens, even when you learn about it, uh, you know, let's take something like the sale of GW Plastics, which just happened, $240 million announced sale price. And, you know, we know it's a family owned enterprise, but we don't know the exact terms of the sale. We don't know the exact ownership structure. We can't guess whether, the, I mean, there are events bigger than that that have yielded almost nothing to the state coffers because of you know, where people's primary residents happened to be who were in ownership positions. And there have been other uh, events smaller than that that have generated huge amounts of, of tax revenue. So you know, it's, it, it, 
it's not like you don't get some of those all the time, but you would be way out on a limb if you assumed that what happened in tax year 2019 was something that was replicable. Um, and, you know, when I say a small number of events, it, I mean, you would be stunned at the magnitude. And it's not just, you know, it, it doesn't just hit one taxpayer, but their, their trusts and, and uh, um, you know, ownership connections that involve a whole lot of, of taxpayers that, that play into this. So um, it, it's really complicated. And I think it would be doing, uh, you know, it, it, it wouldn't be a best practice forecast to just sort of say, oh yeah, that's, that's just gonna happen every year. It, it is increasingly in personal income, and we've called this out for a long time, it's increasingly more volatile because there are so few taxpayers that represent so much of the revenue that we get. That's also true in corporate. That's also true in a state. And, you know, those are just really hard to forecast, you know, on, on that taxpayer by taxpayer basis. And you're going to get a lot of volatility. Um, it's better to have, a, you know, some of that be on the upside, not ridiculously so, but, you know, than to be going in and all of a sudden be $70 million short. And, and that, that could happen it, you know, with the same rapidity that you get some of the upside events. So I, I don't know if that's helpful, but uh, that's how we look at that. Thank you. Mary, you had a follow-up? It, and it is, thank you, Kitty. And it is a follow-up to that. And I understand the principle. However, it appears to me, and, and I was asking you about this last or a couple weeks ago, Tom, that we keep having, maybe we don't have the A repeat itself, but B, it, which is very similar to A, repeats itself so that what in our world we think of as one-time money really seems to be, even if it doesn't nicely fit into the A package and it's B instead or C, but it's all in that general category where it seems to be happening year over year. And, and to me, this is an important question because the distinction between how we spend one-time money versus ongoing is, is really significant, um, pretty, fundamental to our ability to support the work that we're trying to do. And yeah, yeah, no, I, I can appreciate that. And if you look at estate tax revenue, um, that that'll give you the same flavor. Um, you know, multiply that times, um, uh, you know, 100 or less, maybe 50 or something, and, and you get what could happen in personal income if you're just sort of, you know, you, you add up what can happen and the swings that can occur. And they can, they honest, they, they truly can go both direction. I know in the last two years, as we've been on an up cycle, they, there, there's been a proliferation of those. And that also is a function of the fact that more and more income is landing in the, the, the pockets of the, the, the very wealthiest folks. And, and so that, you know, that's good in terms of tax revenue. There's a higher tap marginal tax rate that's applied, but it, it increases volatility. The way to plan for volatility is not to expect that that's going to be there as, a, as an ongoing thing. So it, there's a lot more contingency planning that needs to take place unless the, the cost of dealing with a miss on the downside um, is no problem. Uh, so I, it, you know, it's it's really just a feature of the tax system, and it's changed over time. It's become more volatile, and um, you know, when 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 things are going up, there's a better chance you're going to have uh, those surprises that are on the upside. When things are going down, you can get big surprises on the downside, and we may see that uh, in the coming year. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's the world we're in. Uh, Tom? 
Uh, do you have information on how other states are doing with respect to revenue at, at the moment? Sort of where I, I know epidemiologically we're doing really well, um, and um, and in terms of uh, some economic factors, we seem to be doing better than other states. But I'm curious what uh, revenue forecasters and other states are coming up with. Yeah, I, I, I haven't done a deep dive into that. We've just been focused on this and this cycle was so time consuming because of all the non-economic factors that we had to dig into and how much information we had to sort through with tax in order to get things into the right year and the right bucket and all of these things with deferrals that were happening and all that. So um, I look forward to that NCSL. I'm sure we'll have some information out uh, soon and, and we'd be able to look at that. I'd be interested both in terms of the deferred personal income taxes to see. Uh, I suspect that was, you know, something that will show up elsewhere also because, uh, you know, I, I just think when there's a lot of money like that around, acquisition activity increases. And so that's what gives rise to those enormous you know, lottery type win uh, uh, gains in income. Uh, but I, I don't have information on that. Okay, thank you. Other questions anyone has? Let's see anybody. Well, I'm sure we're going to be revisiting some of the things. Sorry, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, sorry. Um, I'd just like to jump in. I'm thinking about all the, the volatility, and I'm thinking about Representative Ansel's question about what other states are doing. And I'm wondering if you've seen any interesting models in terms of budgeting for such volatility. For example, have you seen um, other state... Uh, economic officers talking about the fact that should revenues drop by a certain percentage, this mechanism goes in. Should they go up by a certain percentage, this um, kicks in. In other words, setting up various triggers or parameters or guardrails that allow for this volatility, because what I'm thinking of, if there are instructions going to the executive branch to cut this amount or direction coming from the legislative branch that points to this. And, and yet these are shifting sands, as you said. I'm just trying to think of proactive ways to prepare for that. Yeah, so the, the shifting sand and, uh, you know, the quicksand upon which the current forecast is done is, is in a whole nother league of uncertainty from anything that you get in terms of normal year-to-year -year volatility that's occurring. So, so this, this situation is in a league by itself because it's not being driven by economics. It's being driven by a, a brand new virus that's, you know, that, that, that's, uh, you know, some people said, we're not leading the tiger, we're riding it. And, and so nobody really knows how it's gonna play out. And that's gonna determine, uh, uh, you know, revenues and everything else. In terms of normal volatility, typically contingency planning is the way you, you accommodate risk like that. So you would have, um, you know, you say, if, if there's this much more, here's where we're gonna spend it. Um, and if there's this much less, here's what we're gonna do. And so you've got contingencies that can, you know, be baked into different degrees uh, in terms of, of of how to recognize the fact that there is a lot of volatility. You don't you know, assume best case and you're just gonna clean up so that when you get that, there's, you know, there's been thought put into what you can do with it, but um, that, that isn't the baseline assumption. I see Steve Klein's uh, on this call. I don't know if he's uh, got information from any other uh, states that he may wanna comment on uh, uh, you know, ways that, that maybe there's increased volatility in what's done. Uh, again, it's particular taxes, the income tax, the corporate tax, and estate tax are the ones that are most volatile. So states that are, are relying on sales taxes, and things like that, more heavily have a much sort of, you know, uh, a flatter 
uh, tax base and, and not so much volatility. Steve, do you want to say anything? Yeah, I would just say that the types of examples we've heard are capturing those extremes, are putting the money over a certain amount might go to reserves or over a certain amount might go to, uh, to a bond fund, to the fund capital expenses other than doing it through um, bonding. Uh, so, you know, it's definitely a way to capture uh, uh, money like that, not to create base expenditures. And we, and we have done that, Steve. That's yep. what we've done. Yep. And that's what we've done too. Also with our pension system. And we actually do that with the, in the event the estate tax ever again produces more money, some of that goes to higher education scholarships. So we have a number of little things in the law to do that. Now we, had a, we had a good August for the state tax payments. We did. We're having, we're having a good August on the state tax payments. Uh, other questions anyone has? Give people a minute. Any other words of wisdom for us, Tom? Uh, no, only that I, I think it's likely we're going to be revisiting some of these things soon. Um, you know, just what's happening in in Washington can have huge impacts on on uh, uh, our futures, uh, both in terms of health and economics, and uh, uh, and and then all the unknowns that exist about this are. You know, we're going to just have to process new information, integrate that with you know, what the impacts might be and then respond. So I'm, I'm sure we'll be back at it in the not too distant future. Great. Uh, and, and I'd just like to announce to both committees since we've adopted a consensus revenue forecast next, the 18th is when the governor will submit his budget and we'll meet together the two committees at one o'clock on Tuesday the 18th. Yeah. And I want to say I appreciate your inviting us to join you because it's not generally we 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 don't we're not part of the budget presentation, but I think it will be helpful for us to hear it. So thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Good to see everyone. Yeah. Bye bye.